Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you this evening, the Sensex and the Nifty hit a two-month low after broad-based selling. Weak Q2 earnings and fears over consumer demand this festive season spook investors. Infosys meets estimates in Q2 with a 4% revenue growth, raises the revenue guidance for the full year and maintains the margin outlook. A flurry of hoax bomb threats continue to disrupt Indian airlines. At least 22 hoax bomb threats in four days have hampered international and domestic flights. So far, the police have detained a 17-year-old minor from Chhattisgarh for allegedly threatening three flights. Hyundai Motor India's 28,000 crore rupee IPO fully subscribed on the last day of sale. Qualified institutional buyers come to the rescue after muted demand from retail investors. This is India's largest IPO to date. Nestle India disappoints in Q2 as revenue and volume growth remain muted, blames softer consumer demand and elevated commodity prices. Nestle's global parent also cuts its full-year growth outlook. Tata Trust Board will meet to decide on nominating a third representative to the board of Tata Sons, the parent company of the conglomerate. Sources say that the new Tata Trust chairman, Noel Tata, is likely to join Venu Srinivasan and Vijay Singh on the Tata Sons board. Israel orders evacuation in eastern Lebanon even as airstrikes continue to pound the region. UN peacekeepers accuse Israel of deliberately shooting at them after coming under fire in Lebanon once again. The Supreme Court upholds Section 6A of the Citizenship Act, which allows citizenship to foreigners who entered Assam after the 1st of January 1966 and or before the 24th of March 1971. Petitioners had argued that the clause changed Assam's demography. Civil society groups had argued that striking down the clause would render a large number of people in Assam stateless. BJP's Nayab Singh Saini takes oath as Chief Minister of Haryana for the second time. Prime Minister Modi along with top cabinet minister and NDA chief ministers attended the swearing-in. New Zealand bowlers run right in Bengaluru. India bowled out for 46 runs in the first innings of the first test. This is India's lowest inning score on home soil. Well, not a great day there on the pitch and not a good day for the markets either. With Sensex and the Nifty hit their lowest level in two months as markets see broad-based selling mid-caps have seen sharper cuts. The Sensex down almost 500 to points. The Nifty lost 200, 985 points down. That's the mid-cap story. And look at the Nifty Auto bearing a large part of the pain today, down by about 3.5% today, taking it on the chin. And on the back of the fact that festive cheer seems to be evasive. Uh, Prashant is standing by now to take us through the market action. Prashant, what's weighing on the market? It was a tough day and it was unexpected because nothing from overnight or the way Asia was trading between 8 and 9 in the morning suggested that we will get a 200-point drop on the Nifty. But that's exactly what we got. The market kept getting worse through the course of the day, stabilized for the last one hour with no incremental cuts. But we left off uh, about 150 points below uh, yesterday's low, which was 24,900. Uh, so that's the kind of day we had. No, Not very much by way of help from banks coming through, either mid-caps, small caps, under a little bit of pressure. Broader market breadth as a result, of course, was under uh, was negative as well. Our declines far outnumbered advances. Uh, you know, if you want to just look at pockets of uh, which saw pressure, real estate as an index uh, lost 4%. That was number one. Autos was down 36 outsized impact from Bajaj. Uh, and uh, there was uh, MNC index, which was down about 2.5%, but smaller there uh, in that sense. The IT services index was the only one large index which uh, ended up with gains of over 1% today. Now, let's get to stocks. In terms of large caps, Bajaj, Mahindra, Hero. Autos really had it rough today. Bajaj, of course, uh, with a comment on uh, slower festive sales, uh, really uh, spooked the markets. Uh, financials, uh, Sriram Finance and Bajaj Finserv were the others which uh, did poorly. Nestle, Ultratech and BPCL were some of the other large stocks which came under selling pressure. Infi stood out uh, in terms of gains, Tech Mahindra and Power Grid. These are the three sort of nifty names which were up over 1.5% each. Now, uh, I'll start with what was down, broader markets. Uh, in terms of uh, stocks, there was BSC which was down for the second day running. So two days, almost 8 9% gone. KEI industry, something similar happening here. Uh, so uh, lost again. Havels was down uh, sharply. Numbers came through in the last hour. BHEL, Obra Realty, Tata Communications, uh, Pyramid Enterprises. These are some of the names uh, which uh, were uh, losers in terms of trade. 
Now, in terms of uh, what was up, there was enough. Emphasis was up uh, 6%. Colte Partle was up 4%, both earnings related. Orient Cements has long been a potential deal stock. 4% today after yesterday's sharp up move. Uh, IFB Industries, 15% yesterday, 5% today. Uh, Kirloskar Brothers, uh, you know, and, and a few others, Ikra, Chrysal, etc., which also popped higher. All in all, a disappointing day, more down than up, all told. Back to you. Yes, that was clearly the case. More down than up. Prashant, many thanks for joining us. Let's head straight to earnings corner. Lots of earnings in today. Infis is meeting estimates in Q2 with a 4% revenue growth. The IT major has raised the revenue guidance for the full year and it's maintained its margin outlook. Rima is standing by now with more. Rima, strong showing there coming in from Infosys. Uh, indeed. So just to recap the numbers, the company reported a revenue growth of 3.8% quarter on quarter in dollar terms. In constant currency terms, it was a growth at 3.1% in line with street expectations and ahead of peers. Now, given the strength the company has reported in Q1 and Q2, the company has gone ahead and upped its full-year guidance. The earlier revenue guidance was 3 to 4%, now stands at 3.75 to 4.5%. So this is not the most aggressive in terms of a guidance upgrade, but the guidance upgrade is welcome and was anticipated by the street. Now, third point is, Growth was led by manufacturing. It saw more than a 10% revenue growth quarter on quarter. Energy has had a strong you know, quarter and BFSI recovery continues. We're singling out BFSI because it contributes more than 30% to the company's top line and BFSI growth was 2.7%. And the fourth positive in the number was that hiring after six consecutive quarters of a drop in the company's employee base, this quarter, the company has gone ahead and uh, hired 2,456 employee, uh, 56 employees on a net basis. So the net headcount has gone up uh, by about 2,500 after six consecutive quarters of a decline. But where does it miss street expectations? One, uh, the total deal wins have come in lower. At $2.4 billion, it's down, I think, 42% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis and 69% on a year-on-year -year basis. Secondly, the street was hopeful of a margin expansion because there was no wage hike this time. So uh, margins, um, you know, contrary to street hopes of a little bit of an expansion, have remained flat at 21.1%. And the third thing is the stock has already run up in anticipation of strong numbers. The stock today was the top gainer, a 2.5% rally. And from early June, it's moved up nearly 40%. So perhaps a lot of the good news is already in the price when it comes to Infosys. So lots of good, uh, you know, but all in all, I think if you have to summarize, it's a good quarter, largely in line with street expectations. Okay, good quarter in line with uh, what was expected. But Rima, what about Wipro uh, also reporting its numbers today? How do those numbers stack up? So Q2 for Wipro is ahead of street expectations. So the company's revenue growth has come in at 0.6% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis at the upper end of their own guidance. But this 0.6% growth also needs to be seen in context with, how, with what the company has been doing. For the past six quarters, the company's revenue growth has been negative. So this time, at least they've managed to clock in a positive growth. So 0.6% is also ahead of the CNBC TV18 poll, which was about 0.1, 0.2%. So there is a clear revenue beat. Secondly, margin performance at 16.8%. It's up 30 basis points on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter, uh, basis. And the third positive in the numbers is the deal wins. The deal wins are strong for Wipro under the new CEO. So total deal wins have gone up uh, to $3.5 billion, but the large new deal wins stand at $1.5 billion, the highest in the last 10 quarters. And the fourth positive is, here. Yeah, I mean, it's not a positive, it's unexpected lines, but the good news is the bonus issue of one is to one. But you know, the street is going to be disappointed with the Q3 guidance. Now, after a strong showing in Q2, why, I mean, not strong, but a good showing in Q2, the company is guiding for minus 2 to 0% growth in Q3, which means at the middle point, it's still going to be a negative growth. Now, is it on account of furloughs? Uh, is momentum waning? Or are they just being a little bit cautious? But again, the sad part is that in Q3, the company is likely to report a negative growth with a minus 2 to plus, you know, to a 0% guidance for Q3. So Q2 is strong for Wipro. Uh, there is a bonus issue, but the Q3 guidance is lower than what the street would have hoped for. Back to you.
Okay, so it's a mixed picture there, Rima. Many thanks for summing up both those big IT earnings for us. And now on to banking. Axis Bank reporting its Q2 earnings today. The company's net profit up by 18% on a yearly basis to 6,918 crores. That's ahead of street estimates. Net interest income also rose 10%. Gross bad loans fell on a sequential basis to over 15,400 crore rupees. That's Axis Bank for you. Nestle India posted a weak Q2 performance and the company cited softer consumer demand and elevated commodity prices. The FMCG giant missed estimates on revenue and margins, while volume growth has also been muted. Nestle's global parent has also cut its full-year growth guidance. Shilpa is here with more. Shilpa, take us through the commentary coming in from Nestle, uh, not just for the quarter gone by, but more importantly, the road ahead. Well, definitely, like you mentioned, it's a weak quarter for Nestle India with a negative volume growth and revenue and margins both coming in below expectations. The company has attributed this to a challenging uh, external environment with muted consumer demand and high commodity prices, especially for coffee and cocoa. And the prices of cereals and edible oils are also rising, the company said. Now, as a result, some of its key brands witnessed pressure due to softer consumer demand and only five out of its 12 top brands actually grew in double digits. In fact, Nestle's global parent also reported a weak quarter and this has been on the back of muted consumer demand and high commodity prices as well here. Now it lowered in fact its uh full year outlook and now it expects the organic sales growth to be just around 2% for 2024 and this is lower than the guidance of 3% that it had given in July and it has also said that the underlying trading operating ma uh, profit margin also will be around 17%. Now remember Mark Schneider was ousted as a CEO in August after the company had reported a whole host of you know several quarters of weak volumes and now under the new CEO Nestle is in fact revamping its uh, uh, operating structure and it's also reducing the size of its executive board and that is going to be uh, something that we'll have to watch out for especially in terms of consumer demand for India as well. Now in another major development also Nestle has said that it is launching variants of its baby food brand Cerlac in India without refined sugar. Now remember Nestle had faced scrutiny earlier this year after Swiss agency Public Eye and the International Baby Food Action Network had claimed that the company's baby food um, in, that is sold in developing nations which also included India actually contained added sugar and an and it did not contain that in its primary markets like Europe and UK. Uh, and addressing this, it has now expanded its range in India, where 14 out of the 21 Cerelac variants in India will have no refined sugar. Seven of these will be launched by the end of November, and the rest will come in in the coming weeks. Back to you. All right, Shilpa, appreciate you joining us. So an important development there. In what is yet another sign of subdued consumer demand, electrical equipment maker Havels has reported a weak Q2 performance. Profits and margins well below estimates, even as revenues were in line. Havels continues to report losses on their Lloyd's acquisition. The management said volatility in commodity prices has dented margins. Shares of Bajaj Auto plunged over 10% in trade. That's the biggest decline since the market crash in 2020 on account of the pandemic. The shares were under pressure despite the company meeting street estimates in Q2. But what worried investors with a commentary from the management on festive demand, the two-wheeler industry has clocked a 1-2% to growth so far in the first half of the festive season. This is below the company's own projection of 5-6% to growth and well below brokerage estimates, which it pegged a growth rate of 8 to 10 percent today as you saw auto stocks all under pressure but remember our auto stocks have also rallied significantly through the course of the year take a look i would say that the first half of the festive has been slightly below expectations there is growth but very marginal growth in the industry the uh, the 100 cc bottom half segment is uh, as per Wahan registrations negative and the uh, 125cc plus segment is positive, but put together the industry is at 1 to 2% growth in the first 15-16 uh, days of the festive. Well, that's Rakesh Sharma, there, Bajaj Auto and Hyundai Motor India's 28,000 crore rupee IPO fully subscribed on the last day of sale. It's qualified institutional buyers that have come to the rescue, bidding for nearly seven times the shares on offer. Demand from retail investors remained muted, fetching 48% subscription. Non-institutional investors subscribed 50% of the shares on offer. So uh, was a tough going there as far as the Hyundai India IPO is concerned, uh, closing uh, there fully subscribed today. A flurry of hoax bomb threats continue to disrupt Indian Airlines. At least 22 hoax bomb threats in the last four days alone have hampered both international and domestic operations today. 
two Mumbai-bound flights from Frankfurt and Istanbul received threats on social media after they had taken off. Both flights have now landed safely in Mumbai. The Mumbai police has filed seven FIRs relating to these bomb threats. However, so far only a 17-year-old minor has been detained from Chhattisgarh for allegedly threatening three flights. Madiha is here with the details. Madiha, you know, this continues uh, for the last four days. We've seen over 20 flights being disrupted on account of this. Well, it's been four days, as you said, that airlines have been subjected to this unnecessary trauma and thousands of passengers have been put through severe inconvenience. But there's little choice here. Airlines have to follow the protocols that are set to handle such situations. Generally, the flights are taken to isolated area and screened thoroughly before clearing uh, it for the next flight. At least three hours are consumed in this process, but is, these threats can become nightmarish too. Like on the 14th of October, Air India's Mumbai to New York flight was diverted to Delhi and rescheduled for the next day. Then on the 15th, its Delhi to Chicago flight was diverted to Canada. Now imagine the state of the passengers who were hoping to reach the destination in a few hours, but were then taken to a different country altogether. And in the case of Air India Express Madurai to Singapore flight, fighter jets were scrambled to escort the plane. We can only imagine the impact it has on passengers. There could be elderly people on the flight, people with uh, ailments, infants or those travelling for an emergency. A mischievous act can uh, have such grave consequences. The authorities are acting to address the menace. The aviation minister chaired a high-level meeting with the Directorate General of Civil Aviation, Bureau of Civil Aviation Security, the CISF and the Home Ministry. The Mumbai police, meanwhile, has uh, filed seven FIRs, have detained one minor for the 14th October bomb threats. The BCAS DG told CNBC TV18 that all SOPs have to be followed, considering that passenger safety is paramount. He said all agencies are working in tandem to nab the miscreants and the guilty will be dealt with as per law. All right, Madhya, many thanks for joining us. Meanwhile, disruptions continue. Now, from aviation to railway, shares of IRCTC fell in trade today after the Indian Railways announced that the advance reservation period for trains will be reduced from 120 days to 60 days. The change will come into effect from the 1st of November. Well, here's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Days after being appointed as Tata Trust's new chairman, Noel Tata may join the Tata Sons board as its third nominee. CNBC TV 18 has learned that the Tata Trust board has met today to discuss the matter. Venu Srinivasan and Vijay Singh are the current Tata Trust nominees on the board. At present, Noel Tata is also the chairman of Trent Tata Investment Corp and Tata International and the vice chairman of Tata Steel. City gas distributors like Mahanagar Gas could raise prices after a 20% cut in their gas allocation to the administered price mechanism. Sources tell us that CNG prices could rise by 6 rupees per kg. Companies will also need to increase imports to meet demand and hike prices to maintain margins. The APM gas allocation was cut after ONGC Petro Editions was allocated a higher share. Well, analysts have now begun to downgrade their forecast for India's GDP growth in Q2. As per a CNBC TV18 poll, 60% of the economists surveyed have cut their growth forecast in the past few weeks. Lata is here with more. Lata, what are the other findings of the survey? And, you know, uh, just uh, the MPC commentary from the Reserve Bank governor, uh, very gung-ho on growth. And what we are now hearing from companies at this point in time is that uh, festive cheer is elusive. Yes, now that most of the August-September data is in and many of it were found to be soft, we decided to do a poll and our poll indicated that 60% of the economists whom we had polled have cut their estimates, GDP estimates, for the second quarter and the cut is between 10 and 40 basis points. So now the average second quarter GDP is coming in at 6.79%. Earlier it had come in at 6.91%. Uh, obviously, not everyone is at 6.79. The largest number of economists were at 6.8, but there were some who were lower. Uh, the Reserve Bank's own forecast is 7% for the second quarter, which they announced in the October policy. But in the August policy, they had had 7.2. So they've already brought it down by 20 basis points. For the full year, there were fewer respondents, but there as well, the average has come down in the past month to 6.85% from an earlier average of 6.91%. 20% of the analysts polled clearly remained flat year on year and have fallen by uh, about 15% month on month from August to September. That is the immediate reason. The uh, export data for from 
September to September has remained flat. August IIP was minus 0.1%. August core sector was minus 1.8%. The September PMI came in at an eight-month low, but it was high at 56 plus. And the September GST collections came in at only 6% compared to a nominal GDP growth of uh, 10 to 11%. That is low. It's also the lowest, probably uh, the lowest growth since COVID. Now, the earnings data also uh, forecasts show that it is going to be a muted quarter. Uh, Motila Oswal says that the QT, uh, Q2 Nifty earnings growth will be only 2% and that the margin tailwinds are also declining. Uh, this e impacts the GVA and MK also says that uh, the Q2 Nifty EPS is likely to grow at only 5%. Put all this together and you can see why economists are lowering their Q2 GDP growth forecasts. Lata, many thanks for joining us. After the break, India and Canada continue to trade barbs as the diplomatic relationship hits a new low. That and more when we return. Meanwhile, the Indian government has taken pot shots at the Canadian government yet again, adding fuel to its already strained diplomatic ties over the killing of Khalistani separatist Hardeep Singh Nidjar. The latest missive comes after Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau told an inquiry commission that there was credible intelligence but no evidence to support allegations of Indian diplomats' involvement in Nidjar's killing. Parikshit is standing by with more. Parikshit. We'll get to Parikshit in just a second. Uh, the Ministry of External Affairs uh, reacting to what has transpired in Canada. Take a look. Canada has leveled serious allegations, but has so far not given any, any evidence to back it up. As far as the allegations are concerned, P PM Trudeau's own admission yesterday would indicate the value. As regards our stance on the allegations, we will naturally reject false imputations against our diplomats. Well, that is the Ministry of External Affairs. Now, the U.S. government has said it had a productive meeting with the Indian Inquiry Committee over the probe related to the assassination attempt of Khalistani separatist Kurpatwan Singh Panun. U.S. State Department spokesperson also confirmed that the key accused in the case identified as CC1 is no longer an employee of the Indian government. He expressed satisfaction with India's cooperation. The meeting that occurred yesterday, we updated, we being the, the U.S. government broadly, updated uh, mem members of the Committee of Inquiry about the investigation that the United States has been conducting. We've received an update from them on the investigation that they have been conducting. It was a productive meeting, and I will uh, leave it at that. Did they also inform you about some of the actions they might have taken? Uh, they did inform us that the um, uh, individual who was named in the Justice Department indictment is no longer uh, an employee of the Indian government. Uh, are you satisfied with the cooperation of the Indian government? Uh, we, uh, uh, we are satisfied with the cooperation. We continu it continues to be an ongoing process. We continue to work with them on that, but we do appreciate the cooperation, and we appreciate them updating us, us on their investigation. Well, that's the White House. Let's go across now to the Infosys management, ready to address the media. This occasion, over the years, that tree has flourished. A happy reminder of the occasion and all the values that he stood for and today it stands as a mark of his legacy at Infosys. Let me share some of those memories with you. Could we have the video, please?
Thank you. I now request all of you to join us for a minute silence in memory of Mr. Ratan Tata, a titan of Indian industry and a leader who exemplified the spirit of India through his life and work. I request you to put your mobile phones on silent and I request you rise. Thank you. I would now like to invite our Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Salil Parik, for his opening remarks. Over to you, Salil. Uh, thanks, Rishi. Uh, Mr. Ratan Tata has left uh, an indelible mark on our country and really for each of us uh, to be able to dream large uh, and to stay grounded. He will be missed by all of us. Let me now share with you an update on our results. We had a strong performance in Q2 with robust and broad-based growth, stable operating margins, strong cash generation, strong large deals, and increased employee headcount. Our revenue grew 3.1% quarter on quarter and 3.3% year on year in constant currency terms. Financial services grew at 2%, manufacturing double digit, Energy utilities and services at 5.8% all quarter on quarter. We saw growth in all geographies quarter on quarter. Our operating margin for Q2 was 21.1%. The financial services segment in the US continues to see discretionary spend increase in capital markets, in mortgages, cards and payments. We've seen slowness in the automotive sector in Europe. Apart from these verticals, demand trends remain stable, with clients continuing to prioritize cost takeouts over discretionary initiatives. We are deepening our work in generative AI. We are deploying enterprise generative AI platforms, building our own small language model, and developing multi-agent solutions for our clients. With our strong performance in Q2 and our current outlook, we have revised our revenue growth guidance for financial year 25. The new guidance is 3.75% to 4.5% growth in constant currency for the full year. Our operating margin guidance remains the same at 20% to 22%. With that, let's open up for questions. Thank you, Salil. We will now open the floor for questions. As always, we request one question from each media house to accommodate everyone over the next hour. Joining Salil is Mr. Jayesh Sangarachka, Chief Financial Officer, Infosys. We have the first question from Ritu Singh from CNBC TV 18. Um, hi. Uh, you know, first on the guidance revision, uh, if you could break down for us, uh, you know, how significantly altered is the demand environment now uh, versus what you saw a couple of quarters ago? And how much of this revision upwards is organic versus the contribution that you're seeing because of the in-tech acquisition? One, if you could begin by telling us that. Um, also, you know, there have been seven revisions in the revenue guidance in the last eight quarters. Uh, could you tell us what you have in terms of visibility now, in terms of the turnaround that you're speaking about? Financial services is something that you've highlighted, but some of the other areas of concern that you've been speaking about, retail, high tech, etc. cetera, uh, what are you seeing there? What are you hearing from clients uh, on discretionary spends? And if I may also a word, your headcount has increased for the first time perhaps in seven quarters. Uh, you know, you told us last time you're looking to hire about 15 to 20,000 freshers this year. Uh, are you on track to do that? 
Um, in, if I may, sorry, add another question on guidance while we're talking about this. Uh, you know, you've maintained the guidance uh, for margins uh, at 20 to 22 percent, but you've deferred the wage hikes to the third quarter. How much will be the impact from that? Uh, and, you know, there was no real expansion despite this project maximus that you've undertaken. Um, just give us a sense of why, you know, despite what we saw with the rupee, uh, why that didn't happen and how much of a hit do you anticipate in the coming quarter because of the wage hikes? Thank you. So, so let me start off with uh, the, so, some of the ones that you asked, and then Jayesh will add a little bit uh, on the margins and also on the revenue growth guidance. So first on the revenue growth guidance, uh, the way we look at this uh, is based on what we've done in the quarter. Then we look at our, our pipeline and look at what we uh, anticipate. And based on those factors, as we sit today uh, looking out for this financial year, that's Q3 and Q4, uh, we've uh, looked to increase the revenue growth guidance. Now, part of it is the, the second question you asked uh, on the industries. So we see financial services, the discretionary spend uh, is looking uh, stable, strong, uh, especially uh, as we highlighted in capital markets, cards and payments. Uh, we also shared that in uh, automotive, we see slowness uh, in Europe. In the other verticals, the uh, view, the discussions with clients are similar, so we don't see any change. There's no new discretionary, uh, and especially the point, uh, the verticals you mentioned, retail uh, or, or high tech. Uh, what we do see uh, is more focus on the cost uh, takeout uh, elements there itself. Uh, in terms uh, of the margin piece, let me first hand over to Jayesh, and then there may be some of the comments on the revenue itself. Yeah, so just to add to the guidance piece that Saril was talking about and to your question on Intech, uh, if you re recollect, last time when we announced the guidance, we had clarified that Intech is now completely included in the, in the last guidance. So there's no additional impact or additional benefit this quarter uh, on account of Intech. It was already baked in, in the last quarter's guidance. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, there are, there are multiple factors that we look at when we, when we give guidance. Uh, you know, a strong uh, H1 performance, uh, the pipelines uh, in terms of, you know, large deals uh, and uh, uh, less than 50 million deals that we have. Our less than 50 million deals have also increased uh, double digit this quarter. So that has also contributed to, uh, you know, increase in our guidance. Uh, coming to your margin question, uh, if you look at our margin this quarter, our margin has remained steady at 21.1% uh, uh, similar to last quarter. Uh, and if you look at the puts and takes, uh, you know, we got 80 basis points of benefit from Project Maximus, uh, 10 basis points from currency. Uh, that was offset by uh, 30 basis points on account of acquisition because of the uh, amortization of intangibles. Uh, and the 60 basis points is on account of uh, the salary and the variable uh, increase that we provided as well as the other costs. So Project Maximus has, has been contributing. It's, it's offsetting by, if, it's offsetting the comp, comp increase in the variable uh, additions that we are doing. So that's that's baked in in our guidance. Uh, we have guided for 20 to 22 uh, percent, you know, for the full uh, full year. At this point in time, we are confident of our guidance, uh, you know, uh, with the the wage hike that we are planning in Q4. The wage hike is going to be in the phase manner. Some part of that will be effective in January, and uh, the balance will be effective in April. Thank you. The, yeah, go ahead. yeah. So sorry. Uh, the, we are on we are on track to uh, you know onboard the 15,000 plus uh, fresher that we talked about last time. Uh, we have onboarded uh, many of them in the first half, but we are we are on track to onboard uh, 15 to 20,000 at the group level in FI25. Thank you. The next question is from Hari Priya Suriban from NDTV Profit. Hi guys, um, Salil, if you could give us a sense on the. Uh, the budget's opening up, right? Uh, the U.S. Fed decision and the elections also coming to a close now. More stability is, is expected, at least in the U.S. markets. So how, how do you see that in your conversation with the clients? Uh, do you see more budgets opening up? Uh, does this mean that, you know, Q3 and Q4 will be uh, significantly better? 
uh, also give us some sense on the growth you're seeing in the emerging markets because we see that uh, it's up and coming opportunity for other players as well so how is it panning out for you and on the margins uh, just to double tap on that you have been on the lower end of your guidance uh, consistently now so do you think with the markets getting better demand coming back uh, that should uh, that should also translate into better margins and uh, you probably reach the higher end and on the fresher hiring uh, specific uh, you have uh, mentioned your goals there but uh, with the new ai roles coming up and uh, so much of work with generative ai uh, do you think uh, you'll do more specialized hiring uh, and will the salaries be better there uh, even on the fresher fresher level and the lateral hiring so let, let me start off i think first uh, on the budgets and then a little bit on the emerging markets uh, and then jayesh will add on on the margins and he'll come back on uh, what's going on with generative ai um on on the budgets uh, what we see today is you know in financial services we're starting to see the discretionary spend uh, improving uh, we we shared that last quarter and we see that continuing uh, as we saw this this q2 roll out uh, in the other industries in automotive we still see uh, the the slowing in europe which we referenced uh, before Uh, and then for the other industries where they look at retail or high tech or telco we still see the discretionary spend part of the budget is constrained and there's still mu- much more emphasis on the cost uh, and efficiency discussions on the emerging markets in in that sense uh, you know our presence is much more uh, in western europe uh, in us uh, australia though for us uh, some of the newer growth markets Uh, we do see good traction in japan a good traction in middle east but relative in terms of size they are still quite small but a good good outlook in those markets you know is because we are at the forefront of this right as in we are a stock broker i would say 50 50 more leaning towards no ipo today more leaning towards no ipo kailash i would lean heavily towards no ipo we really want to be a bank but however we have tried over the last many years we have not been allowed to Welcome back. Uh, Nayab Singh Saini has taken oath as the Chief Minister of Haryana for the second term. Uh, this marks the BJP's historic third consecutive term in the state. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Home Minister Amit Shah, BJP Chief uh, JP Nadda, and Chief Ministers of NDA ruled states were present at the ceremony. BJP leaders Anil Vij, Krishan Lal Pawar, and uh, Rao Narbhid Singh were among 13 other cabinet ministers who took oath today. The Supreme Court has upheld Section 6A of the Citizenship Act. The provision allows foreigners who entered Assam after 1st of January 1966 and before 25th March 1971 to apply for citizenship. Petitioners had argued that the clause changed Assam's demography while civil society groups had said that striking down the clause would render a large number of people in Assam stateless. Ashmit Kumar is standing by with the details on the ruling. What well, a landmark 4 is to 1 decision by a 5 judge bench of the Apex Court upholding the constitutionality of section 6A of the Citizenship Act. Now here's a quick background to it. Uh, there was a 6 uh, year long agitation which concluded in 1985 uh, with the Assam Accords with the deal being struck between the student body of Assam as well as uh, the center. The result of that was section the introduction of section 6A in the Citizenship Act. What this act sought to do is that it provided a window from the 1st of Jan 1966 to 20 24th of uh, March 1990 1971 and within this window foreigners specifically Bangladeshis who had moved to Assam 
would be allowed citizenship. Now, this was fiercely contested uh, by a whole host of uh, petitioners before the apex court. They had argued that this is changing the demographic complexion of the state, uh, that the indigenous population of uh, Assam is being turned into a minority, that they're having to cede political control, they're having to cede employment opportunities, and that this is a huge concern uh, going forward. The apex court, however, not in agreement with that. The Supreme Court upholding the constitutionality of Section 6A, talking about harmonious coexistence, talking about not being able to pick one's neighbours, and then going on to say uh, that the parliament did indeed have the legislative competency to go ahead and to pass such legislation. And importantly, the Supreme Court also remarking uh, that this was a political solution which has been affected uh, through uh, these means and therefore needs to be respected, needs to be upheld by the Apex Court. Uh, the only caveat, however, that needs to be borne in mind is that the Apex Court, the majority view uh, that was authored by Justice Khan, very clearly says that illegal immigrants, that foreigners coming in after this deadline of uh, March 24th, 1971, are in fact illegal immigrants and that they need to be acted against, they need to be deported. All right, uh, thank you, Ashmit, for that update. Uh, shifting focus now, Chief Justice of India, Justice Diva Chandrachur, has nominated Justice Sanjeev Khanna as his successor. Justice Chandrachur will retire on November 10th. Once the government approves, Khanna will be India's 51st Chief Justice. He is expected to take over the role for six months till his retirement in May 2025. Khanna was elevated as a Supreme Court judge in January 2019. He was part of the five-judge bench that declared the electoral bond scheme as unconstitutional and upheld the abrogation of Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir. On to global headlines now, Israel has ordered evacuations in eastern Lebanon even as airstrikes continue to pound the region. The UN peacekeeper accused Israel of deliberately shooting at them after coming under fire in Lebanon once again. However, Israeli army claimed that it was not targeting UN peacekeepers. Fresh job cuts at Meta, the social media giant, is laying off employees across several teams at WhatsApp, Instagram and Threads. However, the exact number is unknown. A Meta spokesperson said that the company is making changes to ensure resources are aligned with their long-term strategic goals. This is a third straight year of job cuts at Meta after around 11,000 in 2022 and 10,000 in 2023. With that is a wrap on this edition of Business 360. More news and updates continue right now.